Do you like playing with balls? No, I'm not talking about footballs. I mean your balls. Our friends at Manscaped, the global leaders in below-the-waist grooming, want you to shave your pubes with the Tom Brady of ball trimmers, the brand-new Lawnmower 4.0, only the GOAT technology for the greatest balls of all time. When you're going towards the end zone, make sure you use the right tools for the job and choose Manscaped. Two million men worldwide trust them, so join the movement with our exclusive offer by using code DTR at manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping. Stafford, under pressure, and a tuck it away. He's in! Durant. Henderson, he's off and running! As was oh. touchdown! Cooper Cup just went up and took it away. Van Jefferson for the touchdown! Aaron Donald smothers him. Jalen Ramsey put the pop on All right, guys, welcome back to Downtown Rams. As always, I'm your host, Alexis Kraft. Join here with my co-host, Jake Ellen Bogan, and we are coming to you live after the Rams' second preseason game of the season against the Las Vegas Raiders. But guys, with sports betting season in full force with the NHL and NBA playoffs and football fast approaching, you need a sports book with integrity and longevity like BetUS. You may already know this, but BetUS has been pioneers in the sportsbook industry for almost three decades, thriving and paying their loyal customer base. That is B-E-T-U-S dot com, and they have loads of bonuses. Join now or call 800-69-B-E-T-U-S. That is 800-M-Y-B-E-T-U-S. You receive 125% sign-up bonus by using bonus code RAMS125. They have re-up and referral bonuses also. BetUS is known as America's favorite sports book for a lot of reasons. BetUS has all your NBA and NHL games with team and player props and loads of NFL futures and NFL odds up already. You can bet UFC matches and props, PGA golf and round matchups and live betting on most sports, including golf. The online casino has hundreds of games and the race book has all your horse tracks. They have every BET type, imaginable and the sharp bet us mobile platform is easy with full of betting options follow my lead and get your phone online and spo- social sports betting partner with integrity and longevity like i did bet us you bet you win you get paid bet us all right so jake last night unfortunately the rams lost by one point to the Raiders. And there's a lot that we can talk about with this game. I'm going to let you go first. Uh, but first, I just want to say hi to everyone. I'm back. I was on a three-week vacation break, which was much needed. I very much enjoyed it, but I did miss being on the podcast and getting to talk about the Rams and uh, you know interact with you guys, even though I've still been interacting on Twitter. Uh, but Jake, I feel like I'm shaking off the rust a little bit. <laughs> it's been a while. So everyone, please bear with me. Uh, I also apologize if there's any feedback in any any mics because I'm not quite home yet, so I do have a slightly different setup than usual. Uh, but yeah, glad to be back. Glad to be uh, you know reporting about this game, even though we did lose Jake. Uh, I'm gonna let you you go first, just with your overall thoughts on the game, and if, if there's anything specific you think we should lead off with. Yeah, well, first off, um, you know, welcome back. Uh, it's obviously been not the most fun talking into the abyss by myself, but i um, glad to have you back, Alexis. Uh, yeah. You know, looking at the game, I thought there were a lot of good things to take away from the game. You know, first and foremost, I mean, we'll just go into it. You know, Bryce Perkins uh, seeing what he was able to do uh, initially, the Rams, I think expected to start him, but also use uh, Devlin Hodges, both friends of the show. Um, but, you know, and I'm going to say this in the nicest way possible. But you know what Devlin Hodges is because we saw him play eight games with the Pittsburgh Steelers in the regular season. Bryce Perkins didn't even get a preseason last year, and he's been with this team. He actually was on the practice squad all of last season. So to me, I wasn't necessarily against the idea of starting him the entire game. Uh, The Las Vegas Raiders started Nathan Peterman the entire game. The, I mean, one side of it, Bryce Perkins went, you know, 26 of 39 through 208 yards, two touchdowns through an interception, but had an 86.3 passer rating to go with nine carries for 41 yards. 
On the other hand, Nathan Peterman had 16 and 24, 172 yards, a touchdown and two interceptions. Yet he came away with the uh, the win. And I think a lot of, you know, we'll unpack it. A lot of it came down to the penalties. Uh, the Rams had 10 penalties for over 80 yards. That's not, you know, winning football. Uh, but you have to look at this from the broader perspective. It's not about the wins. It's not about the losses in preseason. It's about, you know, these players getting an opportunity to show you what they can do. It's a very vanilla offensive and defensive scheme. And so when you're seeing these guys play in preseason, I always tell people, don't worry about the scheme because that's the thing is they're not worried about the scheme. They want to see these guys who can play and who can't. And we saw that Bryce Perkins can play. We saw Jake Funk and Xavier Jones can play. We saw receivers J.J. Koski and Landon Akers and Tutu Atwell can play. We saw Jacob Harris making a late game touchdown. Uh, and he can obviously play. Bryson Hopkins flashed a little bit. Your guy Kendall Blanton from Mizzou caught a touchdown. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, I'd say probably the player of the game was Chris Garrett. Uh, the seventh-round pick out of Concordia St. Paul had a you know almost two sacks, uh, two pass breakups, three hits on the quarterback to go with four tackles. And one of those pass breakups, he tipped at the line of scrimmage that turned into an interception that went in the hands of J.R. Reed, who... While we're mentioning it, J.R. Reed also really balled out in this game uh, and showed that he can play, as well as Juju Hughes, kind of a you know testament to what Coach Evero in the secondary has been able to do. Uh, but you know, I thought a lot of guys really showed out, and you know, big time. Jonah Williams getting a half sack, Eric Banks getting the quarterback on a sack. Um, you know, you even had a you know a nice interception from Bronte Harris. So, you know, I think there's uh, there's a lot of good to take away from preseason. And uh, definitely there were some guys that when their number was called, they made plays and stood out. And that's all you really have to hope for. So the Rams have to feel good leaving this with minimal injuries, albeit they might have lost uh, Raymond Calais for the foreseeable future. Um, he's going to have to get surgery. I think he had an ankle injury that happened. Uh, Tutu Atwell was a little banged up throughout this game, which did put his durability into question, in my opinion. And unfortunately, on the offensive line, uh, Tremaine Ankrum got a little rolled up on with his ankle. So he had to come out of the game in which Chandler Brewer filled in at right tackle. Um, the biggest issue coming out of this game, the biggest takeaway in the negative side is wow. And you've been on it from day one. And we've technically been on it from day one. If you, anyone wants to go back and pull up the tape of us uh, doing our live stream during the 2019 draft. Bobby Evans is terrible. He just isn't the guy that they draft in the third round out of Oklahoma. I'm not even going to mince words. He is just not it. And the Rams, unfortunately, need to cancel the Bobby Evans experiment. And I mean, I know fans are saying, well, he moved inside to guard and he's mainly a tackle. I'm sorry. I just rewatched the game, you know, shortly before we went on here to record. And I'm just going to be flat out honest with you uh bobby evans was just atrocious against third teamers yeah i mean as everyone knows you know you and i during the 2019 draft uh when we took bobby evans were very skeptical of that pick i remained very skeptical of that for for basically always you know he did fill in a bit last season um, or the season before everything blurs together 2019 and 2020, if I'm being honest. Uh, but when he stepped in and he, I think he started a few games or it might've been one game and then he played a lot in, in another game, you know, he had moments where he impressed me and I was starting to kind of, you know, warm up to the idea of Bobby Evans. Um, but after last night, I think I'm pretty much done. I think he basically just isn't it. And as everyone knows, I've been really vocal about my worries about the depth of the Rams offensive line. I think our starting offensive line, uh, for the most part, is pretty solid, uh, with the exception of the center position, which I'm very nervous about. But other than the center position, I think we're doing pretty well. But my issue is the depth. I mean, as we've seen, you know, if anyone goes down, you know, our depth is not great in my opinion. I worry about that. I worry about what happens if one of our starting offensive linemen gets a season ending injury. I just don't see anyone. Uh, you know, Chandler Brewer, uh, I'm, 
I am impressed by so far. I, I, you know, I don't think he stands out particularly, but I think that with development, he could be pretty solid. Uh, Joseph Noteboom, obviously he's been on the team a long time. I know you're really high on him or, or you were uh, for a long time. I've never really been that high on Noteboom. I think he's okay. I'm skeptical about Coleman Shelton. Uh, you know, I just feel like we don't have a very solid offensive line depth. And I think what we saw last night caused some other people to maybe start to feel the way some same somewhat. But I want to start off with, uh, there's a lot of things I want to talk about in this episode, but while we're speaking about the offense, I want to talk about the running back position because you did bring up Raymond Clay, who is going to have to have surgery after his injury last night. So he is going to be out for the foreseeable future. I'm not sure if they totally know if it's the entire season yet, if it's going to be, you know, half the season, but it's, it's obviously going to go into the season. He's having surgery. He's going to have to recover. He's going to have to go through rehab. And I think they're just waiting on the details on that. So what that leaves us with at the running back position is the obvious main guy uh, is Darrell Henderson. Then you've got Xavier Jones, who isn't, isn't entirely experienced, but what I've seen from him, I do like from him. I think there's a lot of potential there. And then you would typically, I think, have Raymond Clay, but because he is out, you've got Jake Funk. And what I think is going to happen is I I think that Darrell Henderson is going to get a majority of the reps at running back, and then I think you're going to see Xavier Jones and Jake Funk mix in there. Uh, You know, Clay's injury really opens the door for Jake Funk. He was drafted by the Rams. I think he was running back four on the depth chart before last night. I think he has now moved into running back three, at least while Raymond Clay is injured. And I think he is going to have a a massive opportunity for himself. You know, I think right now Xavier Jones is ahead of him, uh, mostly because of experience. Xavier Jones has been on the team longer. Jake Funk is a rookie. But if Jake Funk steps in, and he absolutely lights it up at running back, and the Rams like what they see from him, and he's productive, he could very well move into that running back two spot, at least while Raymond Clay is hurt. Because of the timing of Clay's injury, I imagine he's going to be out for quite a while if he needs surgery. I don't think it's going to be something he's going to come back from right away. So I'm I'm imagining at least the first four weeks of the season, that gives Jake Funk a lot of opportunity, and I'm excited to see what he can do. Yeah, you know, um, you mentioned Jake Funk. He actually, ironically enough, started the game, uh, which was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, maybe kind of, you know, is kind of shows how close those two are uh, in terms of, you know, the depth chart is concerned, you know, him and uh, Xavier Jones. But, you know, Raymond Calais, he had three carries for five yards, you know, 1.7 yards per carry. Uh, really for him, I think the injury affects the kick return position or rather the role more than say uh you know the running back room because I think he was clearly a number four they, he just doesn't offer the same things that Funk and Xavier Jones offer especially you know as blockers willing blockers in pass pro I just don't see enough from Raymond Clay he's more of a scat back type of change of pace guy whereas you know you saw some good things out of Funk last night you know breaking tackles he ran to the right side. Bobby Evans didn't really give him much of a block, but he was still able to run, get his pads low, nice pad level, was able to, you know, move forward, get a first down. And then, of course, you look at Xavier Jones, who ended up with seven carries for 29 yards, as opposed to Funk, seven carries for 56 yards. Um, and you would say, well, Jake Funk outplayed him. But one thing I'll, th- I'll throw out there is Xavier Jones had a catch for 10 yards on the box score, but he actually had a few uh, chunk plays taken away due to penalties, uh, which was the name of the game last night, really, and why the Rams ended up not winning because uh, they really, in all phases, dominated this game. Um, so, you know, looking at that, Raymond Calais being hurt led to a guy that we've talked about in the past, Otis Anderson, um, the UCF UDFA, uh, taking two kick returns for 36 yards, not the best, only averaging about 18 yards per return. Um, so I think now the fact that he took over does not mean that he's going to make the roster, but I think it did open up an opportunity for Otis Anderson. Maybe he'll be used more in the run game. Now that they've seen, they've gotten an opportunity from Funk, and they've got an opportunity from Jones to see truly what they can do with a little bit better blocking than last week. Um, 
it's definitely interesting to see how much Otis Anderson will play in the third preseason game. And it's interesting to see if anybody will roll at the kick return uh, role or, you know, what they're going to do there. Uh, personally, I like Tutu Atwell in the punt return game. I don't really like him returning kicks. Um, but I mean, you know, we could talk about that as well. Tutu Atwell has me a little worried there with uh, getting banged up twice in this game. Big issue with his, uh, you know, his size is that people were saying that size notoriously has not been able to stay healthy and survive in this league. And we saw last night he got banged up twice. He, you know, once he had a little bit, he, you know, came up a little gimpy and, you know, kind of, you know, lumbered his way over to the sidelines. And then the other one, he got knocked down and it didn't look too bad, uh, but he came up um, in a lot of pain and they ended up taping his ankle. So while, you know, the optimists are looking at this as if, wow, you know, he got hurt and he didn't actually get injured and he came back and he was still in the game at the end. I'm looking at more in terms of, you know, realism here, not really pessimism, but I am concerned about Tutu Atwell's stature and his overall frame, uh, you know, at this level. I do think it's a lot and he's going to get hit hard by a lot of these safeties that are coming down, especially the way they were using him in these bubble screen, uh, you know, quick throws to the flat to kind of give him the ball it kind of just puts him right in the bullseye range for, you know, a safety that is just coming full, you know, full steam ahead, um, you know, for Atwell to get absolutely blown up. So I am a little worried about that. Uh, but I don't know. What were your thoughts on 2-2 Atwell? I do like that they got him involved in the receiving game, uh, catching eight passes on 13 targets um, for 46 yards. Not the best, but if he had a little bit better blocking, he could have sprung, you know, a huge gain. It makes me nervous every time he gets hit. I don't like seeing him get hit. I think, uh, you know, I think sometimes it can be exaggerated a little bit when you get a player who is undersized in this league. We've certainly seen undersized players before make a name for themselves and, and show that that is not a uh, something that holds them back. But with Tutu Atwell, he's so uh, his frame is so kind of wiry which can can be a good thing, but he's so light that every time he gets hit, it's like he's being thrown around. And as you've mentioned, historically, that kind of that frame has not held up well in the NFL. That makes me worried. He was a second round pick for us. He's a guy that the Rams plan on using for a long time. And I don't like the fact that every time he gets hit, it's a worry. To, to fans, but also to his team. And he did come off a couple times banged up and he did have to get an ankle taped and he really got beat up out there. And I don't like that. I understand that it could have just been a bad game, but I just think both games that, that I've seen him play in every time he gets hit, just looks like it's a, an accident waiting to happen. I don't like that. I hope that there's a way that that can be avoided. Like I've said in the past, my personal opinion is that Tutu Atwell is, is a return guy. And I hope that's not the case, but because of kind of his frame, I don't know how well he's going to hold up. I do think that we've seen a lot from him where he's had really good flashes. He he has really good hands. We've seen that. He does not seem to have an issue uh, with his hands, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but yeah, I, I get nervous every time that he gets hit. I just, I do. And maybe, maybe it's an overreaction, but I think everyone else feels the same way. I, every time he gets hit and you're on Twitter, people are, just kind of gasping a bit, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Something I want to talk about, uh, you know, kind of to wrap up the offense a bit. Uh, well, there's there's two positions. And first I want to talk about the tight end position. And Jake, you, uh, you kind of gave me some perspective on this. But right now for the Rams, obviously Tyler Higby is tight end number one. In my opinion, tight end number two is up for grabs, and I sort of am leaning towards it going to Jacob Harris. Now, here's the thing. I understand we took Bryson Hopkins in the draft last year. Uh, he hasn't really been utilized that much. They have not been using Bryson Hopkins as much as I expected. I understand that last year because we had Gerald Everett. So you really had you know Tyler Higby and Gerald Everett getting about 90% of the tight end play. And you would see, I don't, I don't think we really saw Bryson Hopkins except for a play here and there, but he wasn't really used. So my, my thought process is, well, we all kind of figured Gerald Everett was leaving. So he left. That's going to 
kind of opened that spot for Bryson Hopkins, but Jacob Harris took over that spot, in my opinion. It could just be because it's preseason, but Jacob Harris has shown a lot of potential. He's made a lot of really great plays, a lot of flash. Not really seeing a lot of Bryson Hopkins, which is a little disappointing for for spending such a high draft pick on him. But something you said to me, and, and something I agree on, is he's not used in the same way as Jacob Harris. They're very different, which I understand. But at the same time, uh, you know, we spent a high draft pick on a guy who seems to be used more more for blocking and pass protection. It does not appear as of right now that they plan on using Bryson Hopkins as much of a receiver. So I want to hear your thoughts on that, uh, your thoughts on where you think the tight end the depth goes and the rankings there. Obviously, Tyler Higby is number one. But how do you see – Jacob Harris and Bryson Hopkins being used. And also what does that mean for Johnny Munt or Kendall Blanton who's still on the roster? I think Kendall Blanton, um, I think he actually is very good, but I think he will end up on the the practice squad simply just because we have all these tight ends. Uh, But what do you think that that, that means for Johnny Munt? Yeah. So, I mean, I look at Johnny Munt as, you know, pretty much a lock for, you know, tight end number two, or at least in the kind of that fullback tight end, you know, H back hybrid role. Um, I, I mean, I think Munt offers, you know, some kind of hidden athleticism. We talked about his background and why he's not as athletic as, you know, people want him to be, uh, you know, suffering two ACL tears at Oregon. He was actually, you know, a supreme athlete, um, you know, probably would have been a third, fourth round pick. And that's why he went UDFA. Uh, but they really like him. They have a lot of confidence in him. It's why he's not really playing at all. Uh, so I think he's good to go at, at two. But the thing with Bryson Hopkins and Jacob Harris is that Bryson Hopkins, he was the receiving guy. He's been a tight end. Jacob Harris is a ball of clay who they're turning from wide receiver to tight end. And Bryson Hopkins was a tight end at Purdue. Now, the weird thing about him at Purdue is that, you know, he did have some issues with drops, but he he made a ton of plays over the field. He doesn't seem as fast. Um, I don't know what that is, but last night, you know, we saw some flashes, uh, you know, of what he can do in the receiving game, had a really nice route uh, towards the sideline, had about, you know, an 18 yard play uh, on a a rollout by uh, Perkins. But, you know, I think with Hopkins is that the Rams aren't using him in that way. They're using him as an inline tight end. They're not flexing him out wide. That's the thing, and that's why they have to be evaluated differently because Jacob Harris isn't taking on the brunt of the blocking like Bryson Hopkins is doing. Bryson Hopkins had the most snaps last week of any tight end. He had, I think, 33 was the total. And, you know, to me, I just kind of look at it and I see what they're doing here is that they essentially want to... um you know, they, they essentially want to put Bryson Hopkins and build him up to be an inline tight end. And whether or not he's going to make it onto this roster or not uh, remains to be seen. But again, I'll say this, you know, Jacob Harris, Sean McVay looked over at his buddy John Gruden with the Las Vegas Raiders. He saw what he has been doing and the way he's been using, um, you know, Darren Waller. And I think that is what sparked the Jacob Harris idea. Jacob Harris is going to have a role this year, but he's not going to be wide. He's not going to be tight end one or two. He's going to be his own position, a wide receiver slash tight end flex. And that's honestly how I expect the Falcons to use a uh, fellow rookie uh, tight end and first round pick Kyle Pitts out of Florida. So I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think there's not, you know, it's not a total shock to me. It's not surprising to me that all of a sudden we're starting to see these flex tight ends that, you know, line up in the slot or line up outside on the boundary because it creates a supreme mismatch when you have a guy that's six foot five, 240, 250 pounds, and he's being covered by a corner that's not even 200 pounds. Makes a lot of sense to me. Um, But I do think, you know, Hopkins is going to make this roster it seems bleak, but he's also not getting credit uh, for, you know, taking on the brunt of the blocking, uh, you know, opportunities. And the fact that he's been playing a lot of time, 
Shout out to Blanton, though. That you know, that was definitely a nice touchdown to you know get in between the zone there. Uh, you know, in the back of the end zone, he caught a touchdown last time he was in preseason with uh, you know, John Wolford, and he didn't play last week. Uh, so nice to see him in action. I think the Rams like him. He's a guy that'll stay in the building, and I don't think he's a big enough name where you have to worry about him getting plucked in the waivers. I think he's going to be, uh, again, once again on the practice squad, and I think he'll have a chance next year to compete when. You know, say a guy like Johnny Mont on a one year deal uh, becomes, you know, a free agent. Maybe they don't bring him back. They opt to roll with, you know, the four of, you know, uh, Higby and Harris and Hopkins and uh, Blanton. But we'll see. Um, But all in all, the tight end position, you know, Hopkins hasn't been the pick that I expect him to be. But I also just have to say, and I can't stress it enough over and over again, the Rams aren't using him like how I feel he should be used. They're trying to build him up as an inline blocker. That was not his strength. His strength was how great of a receiving tight end he was, how much of a threat he was, and he could go coast to coast over the top. So that's kind of my take on Bryson Hopkins. I am disappointed, but I also am optimistic. And this is his second ever preseason game. And you saw some flashes there with those, those two catches. He only had two targets. And he came down with two catches for 31 yards. That comes out to be a 15.5 average, which is the highest of any of the receivers. So I'd give him a, I'd give him a chance. He definitely should make the roster. This isn't, you know, Bobby Evans drafted in 2019. Hopkins was drafted in 2020 with no preseason. And this is his first preseason. So that's the argument I would make for people that want to, you know, kind of trash Hopkins. Life is back on sports betters and bet us has your NBA, NHL, UFC, PGA, and yes, NFL betting lines up on their 27th year and live betting on all of it. Log into bet us. That is B E T us.com or call 800-792-3887. That's 800-79-BET-US, bet US for 125% bonuses with promo code RAMS125. Customer service pros are ready to get your phone, social, and online sports betting kickoff started now. Play with the proven mainstay in the industry, bet US, you bet, you win, you get paid. BetUS.com. Ready for an out-of-world experience, fellas? Look no further than the Performance Package 4.0 from Manscaped. That has just taken off in not only the USA, but Canada, the UK, across Europe, Australia, South Africa, and Singapore. Inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag to hold your whole solar system in. First scheduled for liftoff, new Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, this spaceship is here to guide you on a journey to trim your body, balls, butt, and even your anus. This fourth generation trimmer also features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. Thanks to our advanced skin safe technology, the Lawnmower 4.0 has a 7,000 RPM motor and a new multifunction on and off switch that can engage a travel lock and is even waterproof. The Lawnmower 4.0 also has a 4000K LED spotlight you can turn on and off when needed for a more precise shave throughout your travels across the universe. The Performance 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker. It's like having a little astronaut to chop your worst weeds up the top of your nose and your ears. The Weed Whacker is also waterproof and uses a 9000 RPM motor powered 360 degree rotary dual blade system. This nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. Don't forget about the crop preserver, ball deodorant, and the crop reviver to help your little planets be on their A-game while feeling the sun's heat. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their Performance Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Abort Harry Balls, Buzz Lightyear, that Woody with Manscaped. And the last position on the offense to talk about is quarterback. Because something, someone unexpected happened last night. It's that Bryce Perkins played the entire game. Now, that was not the original idea. The original idea seems to be that uh, Bryce Hopkins was going to start the game and then Duck Hodges was going to come in around the second half. But because Bryce Perkins was playing so well, Sean McVay decided to leave him in because he was controlling the flow of the game. 
he was in a rhythm, he liked what he was seeing, and he wanted to leave Bryce Perkins in. Now, Bryce Perkins is a guy that you and I are familiar with. He's a guy that we talked to on our show when he was first drafted, uh, or not drafted, he was a UDFA out of Virginia. Uh, and so we talked to him, you know, after he signed with the Rams. And, you know, I think he's really pleasantly surprised a lot of people. I think his style of play is exactly what Sean McVay wants. I think it's definitely different than the type of quarterback that we've had in the past. He's much more mobile. Uh, he r- runs a lot more than, than the couple past previous quarterbacks that we've had. And he's exciting to watch. He, he really is. You know, he had some moments last night. Obviously, there's some throws that he probably wishes he could take back, uh, you know, that, that were, you know, not great. But overall, he played very well. And I think that, you know, Rams fans really like Bryce Perkins. And I just don't see any way that, that we can let him go. Uh, because after the way, and, and this is something you and I talked about earlier today, you know, after the way that Bryce Perkins played last night, he's not going to make it through the wires, <laughs> the waiver wires, if, if the Rams were to release him. And I think at this point, he definitely has earned that quarterback three spot. In my opinion, and I know that you disagree with me slightly, and this might be slightly over dramatic, but I think he could compete with John Wolford for quarterback number two. That might be a little outrageous. Uh, I know that Wolford has been on the team, you know, had, had more experience on this team, but you know, Bryce Perkins is, is got a lot of potential there. And I don't see any way that the Rams can let him go after the way that he's been playing. Yeah. I, I gotta tell you, um, I don't think you're out of pocket for thinking that now, it's more so my confidence in John Wolford. That might honestly be way too much. And according to Madden, it's way too much. I don't know if you played the new game, but he has a 57 overall, which I think is absolutely ludicrous. But, you know, John Wolford, um, when he got comfortable in the Arizona game, he looked outstanding. I mean, there were times where he was so comfortable. He's just ripping 20 plus yard plays down the field. And, you know, I look over at Bryce Perkins and, you know, 20 plus yards, I think is where he's going to need to work on. You know, I think looking at this game, what we saw is somebody, you know, that has a chance to develop into something. And I'm definitely optimistic about it. Um, You know, he's a friend of the show. So, you know, definitely happy to see that. Um, But I am going to be realist with you. Uh, Zero to nine yard depth uh, yesterday. He had a 63% completion percentage, 4.5 yards per attempt. What was so impressive to me is 10 to 19 yard range of, you know, as far as passing depth, he had a 73% completion percentage, a 9.1 yards per attempt uh, average. Now, 20 plus yards, he did not connect on any of those throws. And that's to me what is going to allow him to ascend to the next level. It's why I don't think he's there yet. I do think John Wolford is. And so that's why while he could compete, I don't think he would win in that matchup which is exactly why the Rams need to keep him because they're going to need to continue to develop him. He he has that deep ball. I posted a, if you guys want to check it out, I posted a, um, a thread on Twitter. Uh, you can look it up. Just, you know, look my name up and then look up, uh, you know, Bryce Perkins. And I posted a thread with some of his clips from, you know, when he played at Virginia and he can throw the deep ball. It's a matter of confidence. He has sustained confidence in his, you know, zero to 19 yard throws. It's what happens after the 19 yards that I need to see more of. And that is what ultimately will allow him to translate to the next level. And the next level would be as a backup or a starter. And I've always said, you know, this guy liked a lot in the draft. He shouldn't have been a UDFA. And I've always said that, look, you know, this guy, to be honest with you, can start. I think his ceiling is a starter, not a high quality starter, but with that escapability last night that he displayed and he needed to, the way he was able to, you know, his moxie and the way he was able to stay poised and, you know, not only make plays inside the pocket, but make plays outside the pocket and, you know, stretch uh, drives. I mean, the Rams went for it on fourth down five times in this game. I know it was preseason, but I love that aggressive nature and they wouldn't have had that aggress- aggressive nature without Bryce Perkins giving them kind of the seal of approval. Like, okay, we're going to roll with him. He's now four or five in, you know, fourth down conversion rates. Uh, the fourth and two, uh, you know, scramble where everything was just off. 
you know, his ability to extend the game there was just so impressive to me. So Bryce Perkins is exactly what I've been clamoring for with the Rams as far as finding somebody to develop, finding a quarterback to develop on a practice squad. This is what we've been talking about, Alexis. You and I have been saying this for years. Sean Mannion is not the type of guy that you want on the practice squad. Sean Mannion is not that type of guy. However, Bryce Perkins is. And so Bryce Perkins, he's not a statue in the pocket. He can move. He has serious athleticism. I mean, you watch him turn in the corner. He was like a running back. He was out running, you know, corners that were coming up to try to make a play. And to be honest, I- I'm just... I'm really feeling good about Bryce Perkins development, but the Rams have to make a tough decision and they may not want to make it, but they're going to have to cut a player that maybe they thought that they were going to keep because they cannot cut Bryce Perkins. He will 100% get picked up. And you know, what I always tell people is when you're dealing with the quarterback position, it's the most important position in the league, right? Because if you don't have a quarterback, you're probably not winning the Super Bowl. So here's my argument for keeping Bryce Perkins for anyone that's saying, wow, three quarterbacks on the roster. That doesn't happen anymore. Well, you know, it does. And on top of that, you know, when you look at Matthew Stafford, he's been banged up. He already had an injury early on in camp. It wasn't a big injury and he came back the next day. He's tough as nails. It doesn't mean that, you know, he's not one hit away from knocking John Wolford in the backup role or the starting role. And then what happens with that? Well, what ends up happening is if you lose Bryce Perkins, then you have to hope that you somehow get Devlin Hodges as your backup and put him on the practice squad. But what does that tell me? Well, it tells me that, you know, you're basically taking the backup plan to be your backup plan. So Bryce Perkins, you know what you have in him. Uh, You're seeing what you have in him. He played the entire game for a reason. And Alexis, I'll tell you, it was definitely, if you're a Bryce Perkins fan, it was definitely a good sign to see Bryce Perkins play the entire preseason game for his future with the Rams. than it wouldn't have been, you know, just having a regular preseason game where he played the first two quarters and then Hodges came in him playing the full game tells me the Rams are taking this way more seriously than I even expected them to. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I think, uh, you know, they should. They should keep him on the roster. I, I totally agree. I think that we've seen him really shine in the first two preseason games, and he's more than deserving of the spot, in my opinion. There's a lot of potential there, like you said. He might not be there yet, but it's worth exploring. It's worth developing for sure. So moving on to the defense, I want to talk about Chris Garrett. <laughs> I want to talk about how he played because he played amazing last night. He definitely has proven me wrong. Now, as people know, when they were watching the the stream, the draft stream that we did during the draft this year, when the Rams drafted Chris Garrett in the seventh round, I had never heard of the guy. I think that you had heard of him slightly before. It was definitely a surprising pick to most people. I was unsure about it. I didn't know much about the guy. After looking into him, I definitely had some optimism, but I needed to see him play. And now I've seen him play, and I'm totally on board. I am a huge Chris Garrett stan. <laughs> I really like what I saw out of him. And it brings up a lot of questions for me. Because if you look at the Rams' linebacking core right now, obviously my main concern is that middle inside linebacking position. I'm just not quite sold on our inside linebackers. In the first game, uh, well, well, I guess I should start off here. One of those outside linebacker, uh, you know, spots, edge rushing spots is definitely taken up by Leonard Floyd, understandably. That second outside linebacker spot is a little up in the air for me after, and I think for the Rams as well. After the first game, we saw really good things out of Justin Lawler. He played really, really well. And then after this game, we've seen Chris Garrett, who has played really, really well. So the question in my mind is, the way that it seems to me at least is can both of those guys start? Because I don't think they can with the scheme that the Rams are running right now. I'm a little curious and this might be totally crazy is maybe having Justin Lawler move inside, which is probably entirely crazy. I'd like to see that tried though in the third game, because I think that Troy reader has locked up one of those inside linebacking spots 
right now it's probably Micah Kaiser or Kenny Young in that other spot. But with the way that, that Justin Lawler has been playing and the way that Chris Garrett played, why not try it? Or have that that second outside linebacking spot, have Chris Garrett start there and kind of interchange him and Justin Lawler or vice versa. I think that that is probably more realistic. But, man, I've really liked what I've seen out of Justin Lawler and Chris Garrett, especially, you know, Chris Garrett last night had a game. I mean, he put on a show, and I really, really like to see that. Uh, so, Jake, what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Chris Garrett, you know, is uh, I mean, you remember, I mean, when he was drafted, I didn't know who he was. I was looking at his, um, you know, his highlights because that's all we really had access to. I tried to get his game tape so many times. I never got I never heard anything back, um, but. Concordia St. Paul D2 guy that just absolutely roasted the competition. The biggest issue with Chris Garrett has always been, you know, level of competition. And, you know, I just continue to say we do not learn. We do not learn as a society in football, scouting, what have you, with the level of competition. I mean, that is just such a moot point nowadays. You know, players can play. Talent is talent. Competition's competition. And so at the end of the day, you know, Chris Garrett can only do what he can do. He can only can control what he can control. And everywhere he's gone, he has produced. And now he can add the NFL to his resume of where he's produced. He went into NFL preseason. First off, let's not even talk about the preseason yet. Let's talk about what he did in the the Cowboys uh, joint practice, showing his ability in coverage. That's a big thing right there. Almost had a diving interception. Uh, looked good in coverage. Then you see him uh, last week having you know, a couple really nice hurries on the quarterback, nice pressure, uh, generating you know, that long arm ability that he has. You know, uses that well. Uses you know, converts speed to power with ease. But then this week, this week is where everything that he was showing and flashing came out all at once. And it came out like a barrage, like when you're watching a boxing match and all of a sudden that boxer just he is in his zone and he's just throwing barrage of punches to the body and then throws that uppercut. That's what Chris Garrett did to the Raiders offense. When you look at Chris Garrett, you saw four tackles, nearly two sacks, a tackle for a loss, two pass breakups, which one of those pass breakups he tipped at the line of scrimmage. It turned into an interception to really kick off this whole you know, defensive mentality early on uh, J.R. Reed with the interception. He had three hits on the quarterback and he also had a forced fumble. Um, So here's my thing with Chris Garrett and what I would say to the naysayers out there. Look, Patrick Omame, I'm not going to just tell you over and over again, this guy is a stud because he's not right. He's a replacement level player, but he's bounced around the NFL And this is also a guy that's played and started in the NFL. He's been a nine year. He's now a nine year pro. And that is who Chris Garrett was dominating. So we can say all we want. Patrick Omame isn't good. But when Chris Garrett is being constantly ridiculed for dominating inferior competition and all of a sudden, you know, he's just absolutely, you know, killing it against a guy that's been in the league for nine years. I got to give him credit where credit's due. And I'm just going to tell you right now, you know, what it comes down to is this. Chris Garrett, when faced with NFL level competition, came through. You know, he when he was up to bat, he came through in the biggest way possible. And furthermore, what I would say is that then they put a uh, they put a chip on him. So they had the tight end chip him over and over again. And they put him, you know, they put a a tight end chipping him and it was like even the double team couldn't stop him. So Chris Garrett just showed you basically that competition uh, level of competition wasn't a big deal. This guy can play no matter what. And, you know, definitely feel good about his long term uh, potential. Uh, after seeing him against the Raiders in preseason. You have to feel good about him long-term, and and I certainly do. For sure. It's definitely definitely someone to keep an eye out for, definitely something to watch. And another thing to watch, you know, at the defensive front is that kind of defensive tackle, nose tackle position. Because, you know, we saw some really good things last night from Eric Banks, and Bobby Brown, and Ernest Brown. 
um, honestly, and Jonah Williams. So, you know, if you look at the Rams depth chart right now, the way that they kind of frame the way that they're using their defensive front, they obviously have three up front and they have, I'm going to pull, pull it up here. I like to use our lads because I do think it's technically more up to date at times than the NFL's depth chart. That's just my opinion, um, but it appears to be the same. They have kind of a defensive end, nose tackle, and defensive tackle. I think obviously, you know, starting day, you're going to have Aaron Donald, Sebastian Joseph Day, and Ashawn Robinson up front. That kind of leaves us wondering who who's going to be the next man up in those situations. You know, your options are obviously Greg Gaines, fourth round pick in 2019, who the Rams really like. Uh, you know, he seems to be kind of used in that nose tackle position. You've got Eric Banks and you've got Bobby Brown and Ernest Brown, who were drafted in the fourth and fifth rounds this past draft in 2021. So what I really liked last night, what I really felt like is I felt like Bobby Brown really stood out to me. I thought he played really well. And in my opinion, I feel like he's that next guy up right as of now after Aaron Donald, uh, you know, which is good and bad. Aaron Donald obviously doesn't come out much, but when he comes out, I think Bobby Brown's going in. I really liked what I saw out of Eric Banks. Uh, you know, I imagine that he's also one of those next guys up probably behind a Sean Robinson, which leaves that kind of nose tackle position, which I'm inclined to say, you know, we've had Greg Gaines and I just feel like, we haven't seen much out of him. Uh, you know, he's had flashes here and there. But I'm almost wondering if in, when Sebastian Joseph Day comes out, instead of Greg Gaines going in, it could very well be Ernest Brown. Um, I think Ernest Brown kind of fits more of that defensive end type, maybe like where Ashawn Robinson's going to be, so I'm unsure about that. But I do think there's a lot of questions right now. Are these guys showing more potential than Greg Gaines has uh, in the past year or two that, that he's been around. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are uh, on that defensive front, um, if there was anyone that really stood out to you last night and what you think the deal is depth-wise there. Yeah, I mean, I think Bobby Brown uh, definitely stood out on the defensive line, as well as Jonah Williams. Um, Jonah Williams, a UDFA last year, um, you know, has showed up last week. He had, I think, two – I, I want to say two – sacks it was probably one but he should have had two um and then of course in the joint practice really showed out against the cowboys but you know in this game jonah williams getting a half sack definitely showed up two quarterback hits constant pressure i definitely see him as the next man up so to speak after the gains of the world and um you know of course you know bobby brown but bobby brown the third man that tackle for a loss he made he that was aaron donald-esque i mean he ripped through uh, you know, the the center and the left guard and just absolutely mauled the ball carrier. And that's that's what you love to see, because this is somebody that did that in college and, you know, has some outstanding athleticism. Uh, so you like to see that on full display with Bobby Brown. So, yeah, I, I would have to say those are the two guys that really stood out for me, um, you know, in terms of, you know, that. Yeah, totally agree. Um, definitely something to watch. Uh, you know, I'm I'm really confident in our defensive front. I think that we have great depth there, uh, as opposed to our offensive front, where I f I feel exactly the opposite. But I think our defensive front really looks good. I think we got a lot of good guys there. God forbid there's an injury to one of our starters. I think that we're going to be okay, thanks to. Uh, you know, the guys that, that we have in those second and third lines. Uh, so, you know, to wrap up, um, you know, the, this pre uh, or I should say post game, excuse me, episode, I think the only thing really left to talk about is the punting position, which isn't really something to talk about because let's be honest, there's no concerns there. But it was interesting. Uh, you know, it's worth noting last night that Matt Gay, our kicker, was punting for us. And he has not punted since high school. Uh, so that was a little bit nerve wracking. I think he ended up doing okay. Thankfully, you know, uh, with Johnny Hecker and, and, uh, Corey, I always get this name wrong. Corey Bjorquez. Is that right? Bjorquez. Yeah. I always get that wrong. Um, but both of them out, because uh, of COVID-19 reserve. So Matt Gay stepped in because we don't have a third punter. 
Uh, the only thing that was a little nerve wracking around that is we did see there was that one play that Matt Gay uh, did get hit. And in my mind, I thought, oh, God forbid he gets hurt. <laughs> uh, then we don't have a kicker. And it feels like we finally got a kicker who's consistent, which we've struggled with ever since losing Zerline. So I was nervous about that, but thankfully he was okay. But yeah, definitely very unusual to see that. Definitely probably not a position that Matt Gay thought he was going to be put in uh, anytime soon or ever. Yeah, I uh, I was impressed because, you know, his first punt was 34 yards and then his next punt was around 40 something yards. He ended up having a, a long of uh, 50. So his average comes out to be 42, which is about, you know, league average, you know, Corliss Waitman, their punter on the other side had 45.2 average uh, with a long of 54 so, I mean, I was, I definitely, you know, was impressed with Matt Gay just being able to come in and punt. I mean, he's done it before and, you know, it shouldn't be that different, but it, it definitely is different. So, um, you know, I think it definitely worked out well for the Rams and for the, uh, the people at home that were saying, oh, just go for it every time on fourth down. You can't do that because if you do that, then you're not getting any experience for the you know, the special teams unit, you know, a lot of this is a learning experience. A lot of these are live bullets, live reps. Um, special teams reps are huge. It's what, it, it, what actually makes or breaks players more often than not. Um, so that's what I'll say there. Um, but as far as the punt return or the, the punting, you know, role, I mean, when you look at Johnny Hecker, you would think he has that, you know, sewn down, but it was really interesting because, you know, I was talking uh, to multiple people um, and, you know, it seems to be like this is a legit competition. Johnny Hecker is not at all saying that he has won this job. It's not like years past. It feels different. Uh, but Horquez was one of the best punters in football last year for the Bills. Surprisingly was not brought back. Surprisingly was brought in with the Rams uh, to, you know, have be on the same roster as Johnny Hecker. Um, Hecker gets paid a lot. So, you know, I'm not saying the Rams have to to cut Hecker, but, you know, I don't know how much of a drop off it is between him and Bohorquez, especially after Bohorquez led the league in punt yards last year, um, whereas Hecker's kind of been going downhill the last two seasons. And I'm not saying that Hecker's bad. I'm saying Hecker in terms of his expectations he set for himself as the league's best punter for the last like decade, so to speak, uh, has gone downhill. So, you know, I, I would, uh, I would say that there's, uh, there's definitely some interesting, uh, you know, an interesting decision that awaits. I'm not saying hackers going to get cut. Um, I'm not saying I necessarily want it, uh, but it definitely does beg the question who's going to end up, uh, being the Rams punter week one. Yeah, I mean, the acquisition of Bohorquez was definitely surprising to most of us. Um, like you said, Hecker has been the best putter in the league for probably a decade now, and it was very surprising for me to see that they brought in a guy of, uh, you know, Bohorquez's nature, let alone anyone. I just think that was surprising to me. I I don't think they can cut Hecker. I, I mean, they obviously can do anything, but it would be very surprising for me to see that happen. I don't see that happening. I think if anything, yeah, I don't know. It It, it is a little wild to me to have two, two punters that good on the roster, but you know, who are we to complain? <laughs> you know, we have, we have two very, very good punters, so we'll see what happens, but I think that's going to do it for us guys. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, listening and, and, tweeting along with us, you know, during the game, you know, hopefully I didn't disappoint in my first episode back in about three weeks, uh, felt like I was shaking the rust off a little bit. Uh, but I'm excited to be back. I was really excited to talk about the game and, and I was excited with the way that the Rams played. I'm, I'm bummed that they lost by a point that was, you know, uh, disappointing, but it is the preseason. Thankfully, um, as always, if you like what you hear, please like, and subscribe. You can follow us on social media at downtown Rams. You can follow me on Twitter at the Alexis craft. You can follow Jake at JK Bogan. We will be back, um, after the next preseason game, but until then guys stay safe, take care and go Rams.
bet with the three decade leader bet us join now for 125 percent bonus or 200 percent bonus with crypto using promo code rams125 and bet sports casino horses pop culture and more at betus.com you bet you win you get paid bet us Get 20% off and free shipping with the code DTR at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and make sure to use code DTR. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. 